Okay. Um, uh, the first kind of overall thing we're doing, I mentioned earlier, is to transform fear into caution and concern. Fear narrows our focus, caution and concern broadens it. You want to look at the whole picture and see what's going on and do it with care. And you want to ask the questions and follow up on the questions and look at the larger picture and each of the relevant details and, and put it all together. Uh, fear doesn't do any of those things. Caution or concern allows us to use our full mental, physical, emotional resources to understand the problem and connect with others so we can get different perspectives and figure out how best to move forward. Okay, it frees us from those railroad tracks and allows us to, to make decisions. So, but what happens when we're stuck on those tracks and it's the middle of the night and we need to get to sleep? Okay, three principles. And it's very important to take them in this order. And these are the principles I've been teaching in my, my class now since the mid-80s. And we have yet to find a situation where they didn't move things in a helpful direction. And if you keep on applying them, they continue to move them in a helpful direction. So that's their, their purpose. Uh, you can call them A, B, C, but you always start with balance. Okay, it's accept, balance, and clarify, but always start with balance. And you start with the body in the balance. Okay, if you try to change your thinking when there's a buildup of tension, my experience, it's like trying to turn a corner when you're driving 60 miles an hour. You gotta slow down first. You just can't do it. Some people can. Some people have that gift, uh, but they're usually not caught up in that much tension because they have other gifts too. And they don't usually do the best job of when their hair is like that. Yeah, yeah, because it narrows your focus. And so the first thing is physical balance. And I demonstrated that a couple times with the pictures. Okay, I stop the buildup of tension, I let it drop in the breathing. Now I want to get real precise and explain how and why we do. And I, I've spent my whole career trying to fine tune this and figure out what it is. And basically, my belief is that these four techniques that I'm going to share with you, and I have videos on my website that explain all of them in more detail, um, basically are the underlying components that address the problem on a physical physiological and psychological level, okay? They get to the core of what's going on. And the first place that I've noticed makes a difference is the autonomic nervous system. It's the part of your nervous system that regulates where the energy goes in your body, okay? I mentioned that earlier. Sympathetic nervous system activates your muscles. Parasympathetic nervous system does your maintenance work. Whenever you're building tension or in a state of fear or fear-based thinking, this one is gonna be activated. Just to clarify, you could be relatively relaxed, but fear-based thinking persists. So even if you're, if you're in balance, if you have a, a habit of being stuck in fear-based thinking, you need to be aware of it and change that habit. But balance allows you to do that. If you're not in balance, then it's really difficult to do that, okay? So the trick is to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system gets stuck on when you're building tension, you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? And what I found just through trial and error and observing and problem solving and when someone couldn't, couldn't do it, figure out what was in the way and, and correct it, was the key is the movement of the diaphragm in a very precise rhythm. Um, the right vagus nerve is about the size of your thumb. It activates the more majority of your internal organs and it wraps around your esophagus. And the diaphragm is a muscle and the shape like a parachute at the bottom of your lungs. There's an opening in the back center of the muscle. It's called the esophageal hiatus. And the right vagus nerve and the esophagus pass through that opening. And what I found is, is when people breathe three to four seconds down, three to four seconds up, without pause, continuous rhythm, okay, when they do that naturally without effort, because when you do it with effort using your muscles, see I just did energy tension in my hands, Okay. You allow it to happen. My students can usually get it on their own online. Occasionally I have to talk to someone on the phone. Um, haven't yet to meet anyone yet to one person who had cerebral palsy and that was a specific case. But I've never met anyone who can't learn this. Even people who are quadriplegic and, and have lung um, cancer or, or lung damage. Um, they can learn to move the diaphragm. Okay? And when you have that rhythm going, that stimulates the right vagus nerve, and within a minute, you've turned off the sympathetic nervous system, activated the parasympathetic nervous system. You'll see a difference. When I'm watching people in my office doing it, I'll see three breaths that they've taken with a good rhythm, 
and I'll ask them how they feel. And every time it's, oh, I feel calmer. Okay, it quiets and it calms because you're not activating your muscles anymore. Now you're in receptive mode. Okay, now if you just stop right there, sympathetic nervous system is going to go right back on because of the stress hormones in your blood. So what you have to do is keep activating the parasympathetic nervous system. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, your liver is producing sugar to send more energy to the muscles to keep you going. Okay? When the parasympathetic nervous is activated, your liver cleans out your blood. So you get your stress hormones out of the bloodstream. That can take two to four weeks, the outside six weeks if there's an extreme amount of tension. So you stimulate that sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system a number of times each day. The number I found is 6 to 10 for 3 to 5 minutes spaced throughout the day. So you're continually having your liver clean the stress hormones out of your bloodstream. Within that period of time, you get the stress hormones out. Now your default is the parasympathetic nervous system. Now you're in receptive mode all the time. Okay, unless you need to do some work or you're going out running, now your sympathetic needs to go. So you want to balance, of course. Okay, but now it's a healthy balance instead of being stuck on. So the thing to do when your mind is stuck at night, because your thoughts are creating tension. So the obstacle to sleep, so what happens if you, if you fall asleep and you're tense, okay, your mind is caught to the, to the source of the tension. So you might have nightmares, okay, or it'll wake you up because, oh my God, there's a danger. Okay, the house is on fire is kind of what your, what's your, how your mind is responding to your body at that point. And so then you wake up and your thought is work and this is a problem. So now you're thinking more thoughts that create more tension and you're not going to sleep because you've got both your mind and your body activated and your sympathetic nervous system is going haywire. Okay? So you activate the parasympathetic nervous system with your breathing. You give your mind another place to go. Okay? And the technique that I found helpful for this, uh, it's an ancient technique. It comes from, so is the breathing. This comes from yoga. It's 2,500 years ago. People figured this out. Uh, they didn't get the precision of the rhythm, at least in the reading I did. That was more trial and error. Uh, but the, uh, this other technique, I think it was about the third century. There were a couple of different places where they, they figured it out. Um, and it wasn't necessarily for this purpose, but it, but it works. What you do is you find a short phrase that you can repeat that gives you a sense of peace and hope. Okay, So it could be as simple as peace and hope. Okay, or peace and calm, that you can say in rhythm with whatever your activity. And if you say it in rhythm with your breathing, you can create a habit that when you say that phrase, your, breath, your, rhythm is, your breathing is in that proper rhythm. So I can't breathe and talk at the same time, but peace and inhaling, calm, exhaling. Peace and calm. Three to four seconds in, three to four seconds up. And then when I'm walking, um, get into rhythm with the walking, Peace and calm. Peace and calm. Peace and calm. Okay? Here's how that works, okay? Think of your, remember I talked about your brain like roadways and creating pathways uh, with connections with neurons. So think of your brain as an empty field. You walk across the field, you can kind of see where you walked. If you walk back the same way, you've got the beginnings of a path. Okay. If you go back and forth on the same path all the time, when you come to that field, you're going to go across that path without even thinking about it. When I walked, to, we're on 15 acres, our neighbor's on five. There's a path that's been there since we moved there 33 years ago. Our dogs took the path. That's how, we, that's how I go visit the neighbors. That's how they visit us. Okay. It's just how we go. We don't think about where, how to get there. So it becomes automatic. So that's through the repetitions. But let's say I've been stuck in fear-based thinking and I'm thinking about you know, unanswered questions and all these things that are building tension. So this path is covered with mud and poison ivy. Okay, and I'm dirty and itchy all the time. And I don't like this path. But every time I go to the field, I get dirty and itchy. So what do I do? Okay, I find another way to get across the field and maybe find a place I like. And I can get across it real shortly, okay, real quickly. Okay, so maybe wildflowers and a nice view and I can get across it in eight seconds. And I'll go back and forth in that same path hundreds of times a day. Within a week to ten days, this path is actually as well worn as the other one, even if I've been on it in year, for years. Now, when I'm on this path, oh, I think I'll go the other way. And if I keep on going to that path, I'm creating a new path okay, to get to my better path. And I don't walk on this other one with the mud and poison ivy. So what happens to that path? It grows over. If we don't access it, just like if we don't access the pathways that ask questions and that are curious, 
they disappear. That pathway also disappears. And my experience is usually within a week to 10 days, my students have to, uh, part of their assignment uh, for one of the, uh, this part of the class is to practice these for 10 consecutive days. And usually by the end of the 10 days, if they've done it enough, they, they can redirect their thoughts at that point. Okay, so you, you, it doesn't work the first time you do it, the first day, because you've got to get the path embedded. And you don't want to change phrases, you know, every other day. Okay, take time to find one that, that suits you, that makes you feel overall a sense of peace and calm. And, and, and just repeat that phrase with the breathing. Now you've taken away the two obstacles to sleep. The obstacles to sleep are sympathetic nervous system and thought, and you've just taken them away, you're naturally going to fall asleep if that's what your body needs. Okay? Questions about that? No? Okay, so you've got what I call natural rhythmic breathing. Okay, let me demonstrate um, what it looks like. And you can practice it with me if you like. Um, I'm probably losing the microphone if I'm leaning back in this chair, but we'll work with it. Okay. Um, I usually have people lean back um, because the stomach and intestines drop away from the diaphragm when I lean back a little bit. If I'm hunched over like this, my diaphragm is pushing on the stomach and intestines, and it just doesn't move as easily. So it takes less practice when you're in this position. And I found a number of tricks over the years that I would use when patients or students couldn't learn the technique, when there was too much tension or whatever else was blocking it. And I made a video a few years back of going through all of those different steps that I, that I would go through with my patients. And it turned out I had a nursing student, student who volunteered that I, that I hadn't met before. It turned out she couldn't do the breathing until the very last step. And this was a step that I'd only used with a few people uh, in, in my career. So. Um, uh, it was ideal that she it was a real situation that she didn't get it, but I go through a sequence of things that you can try if, if it's not getting it. If you don't feel relaxed within three or four breaths, uh, then you don't have the rhythm right. Okay, but here's what it looks like. Watch my hand. Diaphragm pushes down, stomach and intestines move up. No movement up here. Steady movement down here. Most people will start so I'm still getting movement up here. Chest breathing stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. That kind of breathing that I just showed you is probably 30% efficient. 30% of the way. That's good. That's helpful. If I continue that, I'm going to start to feel calm. I'll loosen things up enough that I'll get the natural rhythm established. You can't be in a hurry and you can't force yourself to do it. I'm going to get this. It's not going to work. Okay, you have to allow it to happen. But remember, it's our natural way of breathing. It's how babies breathe spontaneously. Okay, um, and all you're doing is establishing that rhythm. And if you simply pay attention and recognize that's what your body wants to do, okay, and trust that it will get there, um, it will. Okay, the third technique um, is dropping down and bending the knees. Okay, and the reason behind that is when we tense, we always tense up. It's an interesting pattern. Okay, I've not seen any research about it, but I've never seen any deviation from it either. Okay, we tense up. It's right in the language. Okay, we become uptight. We don't become downtight. Okay, so if you stand in a neutral position, okay, which is what I'm in, okay, my pelvis is over my hips, okay, my pelvis is over my hips. <laughs> my <laughs> pelvis, yeah, it's connected. It's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> my pelvis, sorry about that. My pelvis is over my feet, okay? I, I got into this position and I realized that my back is saying, Bob, that's enough. Time to stop, but we're almost done. Okay, so my pelvis is, my pelvis is over my feet, so my bones of my legs are holding up my pelvis. My pelvis is holding up my spine. My head hangs, it sits on top of my spine. My shoulders hang from my head. My muscles don't have to work, okay? So this is neutral. Okay, from this position, I'll do some movements and some exercises, and the simplest is just to bounce down. And the reason to bounce down is you're activating the opposite muscles than pulling up. Okay. So that's three, okay? Um, e there isn't a technique for emotion, emotional balance, but emotional balance comes from those three. Okay, emotion, we talked about fear, but you can expand this to all emotions are physical events that are a result of the perception of the moment. 
Okay, it's a, it's a read on the moment, and they last a fraction of a second if we don't stimulate it with further thought. Okay, so it's just a, it's just a response. So when you clear the body, when you resolve built up tension, now your emotion's clear. Now you're clearing the filter. When you carry all this tension with you, okay, now I'm more prone to, now I'm more prone to anger, okay, and all kinds of other sunburn sorts of reactions, okay. And that's gonna filter the information that I get, okay. If I'm stuck in anger and, and people get stuck there, okay. I worked with a guy who um, had a friend that he uh, was a good friend for a couple of decades, I guess. And they took a trip together and they had a big conflict about the finances from it. They had some kind of a misunderstanding and a disagreement and they were just at each other's throats. And he said, you know, this guy, I can't understand, he was such a nice guy and now he's trying to screw me. And so we kind of explored it and said, you know, how much money is and how long have you guys been friends and what other conflicts have you had? Well, we haven't had any other conflicts, just this one. And it's like, and he's helped me out a lot. You know, he did this and this and this. And it's like, uh, wow, how much money is it? And, well, and how, how important is that money? Well, it's not the money, it's the idea. So, well, that's a good point. So if it's, the money isn't that important and you've had a good friendship for 20 years, what's the concern? I mean, what, what's, what, and so, uh, you know, he just had to stop and think and it's like, it's not worth it. I'll just apologize to him. Say, so, yeah, okay, cool, do that. So he sent him an email and apologized and, uh, and he brought in the email the next week because he got this angry response to the email. It was just like capital letters, rah, rah. <laughs> and the guy totally misunderstood what he said. I mean, he said in the email, and he actually worded it, he started it out in a way that could be misinterpreted, but, but it, through the email, he said, you know, we've been good friends for years, and I'm just gonna trust your judgment, and I'll accept whatever you think is fair. That was there, black and white. He missed it, because he was so angry, he didn't see it, <laughs> okay? When we clear our filter, you can all, two things happen. You see more clearly, and you can understand his anger, okay? And okay, what's underneath the anger? Hurt. Okay, okay, something in this interaction was hurtful to him. How can we deal with that? Okay, now you can solve the problem. So you clear the filter. So the emotional resolution, in my experience, happens spontaneously and naturally when you clear the physical and emotional tension. And the more extreme example is post-traumatic stress disorder, which I've worked with a lot over four decades. Um, and. Uh, it's a similar thing, is, is when the tension is building, uh, anything can trigger a response and you get the sunburn and that's when the flashbacks and the nightmares and everything else starts to go uh, and you feel like you're losing your mind. But what I noticed is when surface tension was clear, okay, when we started by restoring balance and got the surface tension clear, then the emotional response would happen when they were at a time and place they could handle it and it never lasted more than 10 or 15 seconds unless they were resisting it in some way. So the key to dealing with emotion, okay, and, and what I would work with people in, in trauma, so they would start to feel this emotion coming up, their feet would lift up off the floor, literally they'd go up like this, they raise their shoulders and hold their breath, some variation of this, okay, put your feet flat, let your shoulders drop, get your breathing down, lean back, let it come and it is horrifically uncomfortable for 10 seconds, maybe 15 at the outset, okay? And then it passes. And what I found is this just happens again and again over time until people recover. So a good example was a guy I worked with and um, he actually was referred by someone and he was driving an hour and a half to come to the sessions. And he had been in Vietnam and had both done and experienced some horrific things and, um, you know, we went through the balance and he had a couple of experiences where, where the emotion came up and he, he handled it and we dealt with the, the, the stuff that he did and put that into perspective so he was able to, to have a process for dealing with that. And I think we had four or five sessions. And as I said to him, you know, you're driving three hours uh, and I don't know if it's that helpful for you to see my face because uh, you know really what we're doing here. So call me if you have any questions and if I don't hear from you, I'll call you every two weeks, okay? And he called me up and he said it happened just like in the office. I was just sitting on my deck. I was enjoying the sun, not even reading, just, just doing nothing, just enjoying it. 
and all of a sudden someone's behind that bush going to blow me away. Mm -hmm. So I sat up, I put my feet down, I breathed, I let go of the tension, and I had an unbelievably horrible 10 seconds. And then it passed. I said, that's the process. And I can never predict how many times it may happen. It may happen hundreds of times. It may happen two or three more times. But generally, over a period of a year, those start to fade away, and then people don't have them anymore, and there's no more traces of the PTSD. So the structural part of the emotional tension gets resolved through that process. So restoring balance to mind and body takes away the obstacles to emotional resolution. Okay? And the key is to not resist the emotion when it comes. Because okay? what happens is people start to experience this, the, re-experience this trauma because what ha in the traumatic situation they go like this. Okay, that's a natural thing, some variation. So that gets structured into the muscles and then as the muscles let go, that emotion comes back again. Okay? So if you just let it go, it's gone. Not all of it, but just, and it's fascinating because it's just what they can handle at the time. Just, you know, and it's horrible, okay? I mean, I, I can feel it with them. It's horrible. I mean, I have to breathe and let go of myself too, okay? Um, and, and that's really the key to working with that population is, and with that problem is you have to stay in balance yourself because if you're out of balance and you start taking it on, now you're going to make a wreck of yourself. So you've got to feel at ease at the end of tired, but at ease at the end of the day that all those emotions have passed, okay, and, and keep going. So the emotional resolution happens through the physical and the mental. The fourth technique um, in many ways is the most valuable, but it's long term. It doesn't so much give you short term results and it's being taught in some places as a short-term kind of relaxation technique, but I think it's much more powerful than that, and that's meditation. And it's probably the single best thing I've learned in my life. Um, I've been doing it for 45 years now, uh, every day for 20 minutes. Um, and what happens is meditation, and the meditation I teach uh, in my class, uh, I just give them a sound to repeat. This is the simplest to, to learn and practice uh, that I'm aware of. And you just repeat a sound, and it helps to use an established meditation. So I take a sound from yoga that's 2,500 years old, and I also I have a lot of students who are Christians, so I, I use a Christian prayer that's a form of meditation that's been around for about 1,700 years. Okay, so these are well established. I've, I've, there are people who say, just make up a sound, and people I've worked with who do that don't stay with it as well and don't have the same effects. So the, the type of sound somehow makes a difference and why not stick with something with, that's worked for over a thousand years. So I teach these two sounds. Uh, the first is so on the inhale, hum on the exhale. And the reason I like it is it has a neutral connotation. It means this and that in Sanskrit. Okay, so as you breathe in, hum as you breathe out. Or for a Christian meditation, couldn't be simpler, you just repeat the name Jesus very slowly with the breath. G as you breathe in, Z as you breathe out. Okay, so and if you have a spiritual tradition, you probably have a meditation. Just about all of them do. Um, uh, the Jewish uh, meditation is a little harder to find, but it's there and it's been practiced for hundreds, hundreds of years. Um, and there's a real similar process. Okay, so here's what happens: you're doing the natural rhythmic breathing. You're sitting in a neutral place, and if your mouth is drying out, you take a drink. Okay? And that's a key to meditation. It isn't like you put yourself into some uncomfortable position or you've got an itch and you can't scratch it. Okay? <laughs> if you're thirsty, take a drink. Okay? So you're in a relaxed place and you're focusing on the breathing and you start repeating the sound and you get distracted. Guaranteed. Okay? And people say, oh, I can't meditate because I'm too distracted. That's like saying, I can't swim because there's too much water. Okay? Distractions are what you do. That's what you're dealing with. Okay, so you get distracted, you let it go, you come back. You get distracted, might be a minute or two, you let it go, you come back. You get distracted, you let it go, come back. Get distracted, let it go, come back. That can happen hundreds of times. 20 minutes seems to be an ideal time to do it. Every time that happens, you're creating a pathway in your brain to let go and to focus where you choose. And that is a valuable skill. That is the opposite of fear-based thinking. Fear-based thinking is pulling us and you let go and go to what's important. It's pulling us, you let go and come forward. So that becomes more well established the more you practice it. And frankly, it's, it's like brushing your teeth. Uh, I wouldn't even consider counseling or doing a training without brushing my teeth. 
Uh, neither would I without meditating. I mean, it just, it just clears my mind. And I went on vacation once and I thought, okay, I'm going to take a break from meditating. By the third day, my mind was the equivalent of not having brushed my teeth. It's like, no, I don't like that. I'm going to do this. Okay, and it just becomes part of the routine. But it's the opposite of fear-based thinking. I think yeah. it's important to share with students, too, something that I, not to do something that I did for several years, and that is be judgmental about oneself oh. for having thoughts. They're yeah. not the enemy. Right. They just are. Yeah, yeah, that's what we work with. Them. Yeah. Be curious about them and be willing. Yeah, and the bottom line is that judgment is fear-based thinking. Absolutely. Judgment doesn't really provide anything useful when we give a negative judgment. We use the, when you judgment in terms of a dead end category. Yeah, a dead end label or category, it just restricts. Okay, there's judgment in terms of judging the value of something, and there's other ways that term can be used. So I don't mean mean it in that way. But judging another person or judging ourselves harshly is a key component of fear-based thinking. And when we let go of that, we see that that's just essentially a waste of time or and effort. Well, if we're stuck in fear-based thinking, we are. Yeah, but we can also become our own best friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, so four techniques, okay? That helps you to restore balance. The next two, uh, and I've got a video on this on my website, acceptance uh, basically removes the obstacles to uh, dealing with fear-based thinking or dealing with any problem that you have, okay? And in terms of, of um, dealing with a person who's stuck with fear-based thinking, uh, acceptance can be critical because if you confront it head-on, given that they're stuck in fear-based thinking, they're gonna either attack or divert or, or dismiss, okay? You're not gonna get anywhere. You can't do a frontal assault on fear-based thinking. You have to understand first. And acceptance, just as you said, let's go of judgment, let's go of blame, let go, let's go of fault, recognizes this is the beginning point of the, of the problem solving, and this is where we begin, accepts that without going back to what should be or anything like that. This is just where we start. And you recognize the essential dignity of the other person and that, that they have value and that their, their needs and their emotions are the same as ours. And you, and you approach it from that perspective. Okay, that allows you to then establish those relationships and that, and that takes time. And that's what those people did who turned around the Klan member and the, and the white supremacist, okay, in their thinking. There was a, a, an acceptance there, okay. Um, and then you ask questions. You try to understand. You try to see a larger picture and relevant details more clearly. It's as simple as that. You just keep asking questions, okay? And there can be thousands of them, but each one gives you another little piece of the picture and more often raises another question, okay? And as you're expanding your frame, you get it big enough so that you see the opportunities, you see the resources, you see the limitations, and now you can start solving the problem, okay? In terms of confronting someone and dealing with their fear-based thinking, particularly if it's a boss or supervisor, you know, that could take a year or more. And I've worked with people who've done that, okay, where you set up a long-term strategy and you adapt it, but for, you have to start by understanding their emotions, understanding their needs, not their need for control because that's a, that's a distorted need, but their need maybe for safety or acceptance, which is a universal human need. And we all have these same needs, and if I understand that's what that person is needing, then I can figure out ways to try to meet that and help them feel more comfortable with me in some way. Can't do it like that, okay? But over time, I can plant seeds and have those seeds grow. And, and this, I worked with a lot of people who, um, uh, where one part of a couple would come in for marriage counseling, and the other person could or wouldn't come in for some reason. And, and what I found is that, that that was often very effective. Actually, most of the time, they could be very effective in doing that. That wasn't a hindrance at all. And, and I thought of it as like two walls. They came in and there were two walls and I thought of water in between the walls, putting pressure on the walls. And as the walls got thicker, because they respond to the pressure by becoming thicker, okay, so they come thicker, and the water is narrower, which actually increases the pressure on the wall, which makes them thicker. And so the water is the judgment and the belief that I'm right and you're wrong and, and all of that stuff, and it just keeps on getting worse and the defensiveness gets bigger. One person chooses to take their wall down. To do that, they have to restore balance. You're not gonna do that when you're out of balance, okay? 
maybe there's some saints who have done it. I don't know. I didn't meet any of them. But the people I've worked with have to do it this way, and me too. Okay, you take down that wall. Okay, the water seeks its own level. It's gone. There's no more pressure on this wall. Okay, once it happened in a week, and I, that, I still don't know how that, how it worked, but it did, and it stayed. But most of the time, we're talking months. This wall comes down, and there's no more judgment, no more pressure. This wall, we want to need it, and our nature. And I, after 40 years of working with people on this level, I'm convinced that our nature is to connect, okay, and see the dignity and respect that everybody is due, okay. And when we stop the fear-based thinking and stop the judgment and take down our wall, the other wall comes down too. Um, and we need to think about that. We need to always be asking questions, which is what we do when we clarify. So balance, accept, and clarify. Questions? No? Okay. Um, what would happen if you people all told everybody you know about fear-based thinking and they told everybody they know about fear-based thinking and they told everybody they know about fear-based thinking and fear-based thinking was eliminated from the world? What would the world be like? Okay. I, I planted, I planted a dogwood tree um, on our property back in 1991, and it was before my car accident, and um, I, I, my back was in trouble, and I couldn't water it, and we had a drought anyway, and so a lot of the trees I planted that year didn't make it, and I assumed that tree died along with the rest of them. And it was kind of in a back meadow, and I didn't get back there that much. <clears throat> and um, 17 years later, I was walking in that area in early spring, and I noticed a little indentation because I always made a bowl so the water would flow to the tree. And here's that dogwood tree, the same size as when I planted it. And I went and I bent it, and it, was, it didn't break. It was still alive. It's like, oh my gosh. And uh, I dug it up, and I moved it into our garden. We had a, a fence all the way around it to keep the deer and the rabbits out and good organic soil and, and drip irrigation, all kinds of stuff. And um, my wife says, why are you planting that chewed up spindly stick? And I said, this is a dogwood tree that I planted all this time ago and it's still alive. Okay, and now, whoops, missed that question. That dogwood tree is eight feet tall. And in the spring, it's covered with white flowers. And in the winter, it's covered with white berries. And a couple of Christmases ago, there were 10 cardinals, five females and five males, that had Christmas dinner on our dogwood tree. Okay? So I ask, what's the true nature of a dogwood tree? The chewed up spindly stick was how it adapted to ongoing threats from deer and rabbits and drought. Okay? We've been stuck in some form of fear-based thinking for a few thousand years. I mean, war and and, and colonialization and, and moving to new places, there's always been this fear thing. But there's an archaeologist who did some research and found very little evidence of human-to-human -human violence or hierarchy, power over, for the first 95% of human existence. That fear-based thinking in war and violence, and you could make a case that war and violence are a result of fear-based thinking, is a recent phenomena in human existence. Could we be the human equivalent of a chewed up spindly stick? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. <laughs>